So finally, because of the Gershwin Initiative, they took Ryan Banyagali's work mm -hmm. and created a new critical edition, which became this new recording that was just released a couple of weeks ago. And that's with the Adrian Symphony in Michigan and dear friend Bruce Anthony Kiesling conducting. Okay, it's so lovely to talk to you again. Same here. You are a very busy man. I see you have m many things and, and you're involved in, in quite a lot of things. Um, so interesting to see. Thank you. Well, there's, there's so many different kinds of things that one can do in yeah. music. And I think it's, it's not the kind of things where I say, well, what should I do now? Mm. Or, you know, it's not something that one thinks about, really. It's, it kind of presents itself in a way where there are doors. And if you open it and it looks like it's something, I mean, it's like you go to a supermarket and you just look around. I'm basically just looking around and feeling and thinking, you know, what, what, what's something that might be interesting for people to listen to or to see, or what could be important for music now for the future? Mm -hmm. And it isn't the kind of thing where um, you manufacture it. I remember my teacher was Adele Marcus and she used to say, you can't manufacture feelings. You can't think about the way something should sound. You have to feel it. And if you don't feel it and you think about the way it should sound, then you are manufacturing it and it isn't real. Yeah. I'll never I'll never forget that. But that's and it, true, true words. Yeah. With many and it took me with it's with everything. You know, she used to say you need to feel from the inside out, not from the outside in. Meaning not because somebody tells you, oh, that should be sad, or that should be sad. Because Inevitably, even for piano or any instrument, the point of departure between you and that instrument is coming from your inside. Mm. So you could think all the, as much as you want about, well, that should sound sad or soft. Or, it doesn't really quite work that way. I think it's an emotion that has to spur the mind how to create that sound, but it's always based on the feeling. Mm. So that's why I try to be busy with things that come from root feeling mm. and it took me so many years to do that mm. i think it's it's um also this thing where if you have to explain to people if you have to explain to somebody like you say why or um you know then already i think you lost it <laughs> if but if you can just mm -hmm. do it and and do it with such a like you say, with such an insight that that can be transported for somebody else to uh, to feel it. Yeah, totally. I totally understand what you're saying. It's a not just a feeling inside, but it's a this driving force mm. that is in the roots of the tree of what you're feeling. You know, this the soil is, has to be there before you plant the seeds. Yeah. So I think it's a driving force, something that then presents itself, if it does, doesn't always. And sometimes things present themselves in times that you wouldn't expect them to, mm. which is really unusual. Uh, but that's just the way it is. It's like yeah. I always say, you know, it's the yellow brick road. You make a turn to the right, there's something there, you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that there. That's going to be a tree. You know, yeah. or that plant, I never noticed that. And that kind of leads to what we're going to talk about. I mean, yeah. the Rhapsody in Blue. I mean, yeah, yeah. I want <laughs> to know because it's it's so, it looked so amazing uh, what you were doing there and uh, the sound and everything, yeah. It's such an unusual journey, this piece. Mm -hmm. It's finally coming home, I think, nearly 100 years since it was composed uh, very, rather quickly, actually. I mean, the story, of course, many people know the story, many people don't know the story. When George was playing billiards and uh, with his friend, Buddy De Silva, and, you know, then they, uh, 
the, his brother Iris, and, you know, hey, you know, they, it's in the papers, this the whole thing about, well, there was a whole backstory to it, mm -hmm. which uh, led up to why George decided to write the Rhapsody in Blue. It was kind of a competitive thing with another composer where uh, there was the George White scandals and then Paul Whiteman came into the picture. And as soon as George heard that somebody else was going to be writing something for this particular experiment in modern music that Paul Whiteman was going to conduct his band, he was like, ah, I think I better do it. And he and um, Buddy De Silva, who wrote uh, Blue Monday in 1922 for the George White scandals, and the opera didn't last very long. I think I'm getting my facts right. I'm, I sometimes oh, okay. the, there's, there's a story, but yeah. uh, Paul Whiteman liked the music. The mm. music was good. And those were some of the seeds of Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, I see. And when Ira noticed in the newspaper, they were announcing this concert um, like a month out. It was February of 1924, like a month earlier. Mm. Ira said, oh, they're listing this concert with your new piece that you're writing for. He says, oh, yeah, I forgot. I can't do it. I, I'm not going to be able to do it. Well, he Maybe. was convinced to do it. Yeah. And he many of the ideas for Rhapsody in Blue were born on a train. And really? The, and the idea of the piece being a kind of melting pot of styles and themes. A rhapsody really in Greek means to sew, sewing. Oh, and it's okay. many ideas. When people say it's rhapsodic, it means there's so many different ideas happening within the scope of one piece. So it's a lot of ideas threaded together, sewn together, rhapsodic. And that wasn't the original title. He ended up calling it Rhapsody in Blue. And it's a story people will, you know, I don't want to give the whole history lecture about that, but you could look it up online. There's many wonderful stories about the, how it got created. Mm. And after he finished writing this rather quickly, um, he put notations in his manuscripts for this instrument, that instrument, whatever he think he, he was able to do. And then, of course, he studied orchestration more um, extensively. I believe it was Charles Hambitzer. And he orchestrated the concerto in F a year later, like 1925, by himself. So he was quite good. I mean, I'll tell you the story about his meeting with Ravel after. But Ferdi Grofe, who was a band leader, composer. Oh, no, he wasn't the Paul was the band leader. But Freddie Grofe was the orchestrator. He wrote for the for, for the band. He, he orchestrated it for the Paul Whiteman band. And all these names, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's a lot, a lot to remember. And Grofe visited George Gershwin, and George played through the Rhapsody and presented this score to him, which he had to then put into score form for the players. And he gets to that theme, bum, 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 but that's not what he played. He played something else. And when he started playing that section, Groveface stopped him. He says, well, I don't know. That doesn't quite, what, what else do you have? And he says, well, I, I, I don't have anything else. I mean, well, I could try this, I could try that. And then he played that theme that we know, bum, 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 bum. He plays this and he says, well, I wrote that like four or five years ago. And so it was like from 1919 or so, which was the year of Swanee, the lullaby and some other uh, pieces. And Grofe said, Freddie Grofe said to him, I, I kind of like that. Let me sleep on it. The next morning, Freddie Grofe called George Gershwin and said, that's what you're using there. I couldn't get it out of my head. Really? That's the story. Why do we know the story? If mm. you go to YouTube and type in Freddie Grofe reminisces or mm. Rhapsody in Blue, there is a recording, mm. an audio recording of him telling this whole story. 
Really? It is fantastic. Mm. You hear his voice, and he tells the story about how Rhapsody in Blue really happened. In Freddie Grove phase, yeah. it's wonderful. Mm. And so the Rhapsody in Blue was a big hit, and Gershwin, of course, wanted to, he played it. And the original manuscripts were there. Most of the time, they were directives. Mm -hmm. Like they'd be, he didn't write everything in that first version. It was improvised or whatever. But there would be, like, Paul Whiteman would say to him, well, when do I come in with the band again after you play the solo piano cadenza? He said, it says in the score, wait for nod. Oh. <laughs> wait for <laughs> nod. Meaning, you can go. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's how it was. Then, of course, there were some recordings of Gershwin playing on the piano. And there's a solo version where he superimposes the orchestra and the solo on the piano rolls and all that. Of course, he couldn't do all that at the same time. And then it was further expanded in 1927 by Grofe and 1942 orchestration is the big version. You know, that's the big movie Rhapsody in Blue version. Mm -hmm. And it's a much thicker orchestral sound, more strings, much more symphonic orchestra sound, which took them away from that original band sound with okay. the saxophones and the banjo and the leaner strings and the sopranina sax. And it was a different sound. Mm -hmm. You can hear a recording of the 1924 performances of Rhapsody in Blue on YouTube also. But those weren't even the very original. There's a few things in there. From there, some piano rolls you could listen to where Gershwin does <clears throat> a few different things <clears throat> all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's a composer. He's not going to play it the same way all the time. Um, composer of improvisatory nature. And so Ryan Banyagali did a Harvard dissertation several years ago, at least a decade ago, on Rhapsody in Blue. And it became part of a project which is ongoing, started recently from the University of Michigan Gershwin Initiative, which means they're going to go back to the sources not just what you've heard recorded, but the sources, the original sources, manuscripts, recordings, to come up with the definitive critical edition based on those sources and a performance edition. So the critical edition is the original written sources. And that's what Dr. Ryan Banyagali did. And that was his Harvard dissertation. That is the critical edition which is now part of the Gershwin Initiative, the archives and the ca catalog of the original sources. That is the edition that I recorded recently. Okay. So nearly, well, I'll give you an idea. I'm going to show you two things. Here is a wonderful recording. Yeah. Okay. This is Manhattan Intermezzo, it's called, because that is Neil Sedaka's piano concerto, mm -hmm. which he composed a decade ago. And I was able to do some fundraising and raise money to do this recording, which features first Neil Sedaka's piano concerto, which his Ferdy Grofe <laughs> was uh, Lee Holdridge, who orchestrated around the piano part that Neil wrote. Then I have Keith Emerson's piano concerto on here. And Keith was a fabulous keyboardist and composer. His piano concerto from 1976 his Ferdy Grofe was John Mayer. He orchestrated the concerto. Then you have Duke Ellington's New World of Coming from the 1940s, which was arranged and edited by Maurice Perez, based on the sources and to make the sound according to what Ellington played in there. Then we close with Rhapsody in Blue. And this is the Grofe orchestration of 1942. But... Oh, okay. But in there, and this was recorded uh, 2014, mm -hmm. and it was, was released, when were you released? 2016, just a few months before Keith Emerson passed away and gave his approvals, and he enjoyed the recording of his concerto. So 2014, we didn't have this. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. We didn't yet have it published of the critical edition of Ryan Vanyagali mm -hmm. of Rhapsody mm -hmm. in Blue. This mm. is a journey. We're really mm. just part of history, mm. almost history correcting itself. And there were, I mean, the piano part I play in the recording, the Naxos recording of titled Manhattan Intermezzo, the Rhapsody in Blue there features the Brown University Orchestra with Paul Phillips conducting. He was the music director of the um, Brown University Orchestra in Rhode Island. They were all non-music majors. They played so, mm. so well. And these brilliant minds, these really great kids. And that piano part, I included many of the missing measures of the original piano part. The orchestration was 1942, but the piano part was earlier. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So finally, because of the Gershwin Initiative, they took Ryan Banyagali's work mm -hmm. and created a new critical edition, which became this new recording that was just released a couple of weeks ago. And that's with the Adrian Symphony in Michigan and dear friend Bruce Anthony Kiesling conducting. So we were going to do it a year earlier, but the pandemic forced us to push everything uh, later in time. Mm. So that's kind of how the history of Rhapsody in Blue has evolved from but 1924 how, to 2021. Yeah. But how did you get to this project? I mean, how did you find out about this um, uh, the score and, and that this or this, this uh, information? I was I got to know the family, uh, the Gershwin awesome. family a bit, but yeah. that was when, you know, many years ago, uh, at least 25 years ago, mm. uh, Dr. Alicia Zizzo, who is a pianist and a musicologist, she, I've known her because we've lived on Long Island and she's come to my concerts and she said to me, you know, I've been friends with Edward Jablonski, who wrote the biography of George Gershwin and... Mm you know, Ed told me there was more to the pieces than I knew. And she was able to get a uh, family permission to look at original scores at the Library of Congress and found really? un unpublished yeah. songs, the uh, fragments of preludes that be that were supposed to be 24 preludes mm -hmm. modeled after Chopin 24 preludes. Gershwin wanted to write 24 preludes and call it the melting pot. And one of those was called Lubato in 1923, which Vanity Fair magazine called a tribute to Chopin. Mm -hmm. So there was this love of classical music. I mean, that's a, a given. He loved Ravel, he loved Debussy, he loved Chopin. He went to Ravel in Paris, uh, Gershwin, and said, I want to study with you. And, you know, there, most people know the story. Mm -hmm. Maurice Ravel said to him, you know, I hear you make a lot of money doing what you do. What do you, how much do you make? You know, how much money do you make? He said, and he told him, he says, oh my God, I should be studying with you. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> but, but Maurice Ravel said something very important to George Gershwin. He says, you know, it's better you be a first-rate Gershwin than a second-rate Ravel. Mm -hmm. So Alicia brought these music uh, scores to me that she was doing for Warner Brothers publications, piano uh, publications of the seven preludes. So it's six preludes, which have the famous three and three others. And the seventh is a fragment composed in January, 1925. It's a short little piece that becomes the third movement of the concerto in F later in 1925, when he finished it at Chautauqua, New York in the summer camp. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was that and other pieces. And then she showed me the Rhapsody in Blue. It was lots and lots of measures that I'd never seen before. It's just they're all from the original sources. Really? So I was supposed to play Rhapsody in Blue in April 1997. Mm -hmm. And then June 1997. April was with the Greater Bridgeport Symphony in, in Connecticut with their now late but beloved music director, Gustav Meyer, who was a great teacher to many wonderful conductors today. And then one concert with the Boston Pops in June that year. And as soon as I shared this with them all, we, I played some of it with the Bridgeport Symphony, 
but then all of the missing measures with the Boston Pops, and we called it the premiere of the, the Zizzo edition of the uh, original Rhapsody in Blue, as we had it then. Mm. So we had orchestration was 1942, piano part was from 1920 something. And it was different. The one concert turned into four. We did four concerts. And uh, it was really a lot of fun to play it that way and hear it that way. And um, the years went by and I would always say, yeah, why can't we get the orchestration now to be what was original with the piano part? So we have one score to work with because there were like four measures that the orchestra plays wasn't in their score. So I told the conductor, I'll play them. So I played them for a bunch of years. Now they're back. They're in the ah. orchestra part. Mm -hmm. So then the years went by and I became friendly with the people who are at the Gershwin Initiative. And Mark Clegg is the director at the University of Mer uh, Michigan. And they told me that the new critical edition was available. So two years ago, it was getting just a few performances. I gave one of the first few with the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. Mm. And Ryan lived there. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. So he came, mm -hmm. he came to the concert. We had interviews with the audience about it and he talked about it. And it was great to meet him finally because of this work that he did. It's an incredible achievement what he has done. Mm -hmm. And I thought after that performance, there were a couple of them, we did two concerts. I thought I want to be the first to record this version. Mm -hmm. You know, the Rhapsody in Blues, like I said earlier, it's a, a driving energy inside. And then emotionally, you just feel like you're part of this journey with the piece. I always loved Rhapsody in Blue. When I was a child, my father loved it. He would have the Oscar Levant classic benchmark mm -hmm. recording in his mind. And he he got he knew that style. He grew up with that style. Uh, my father loved the swing era. But what I learned swing era, it took me decades to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is music is mostly ragtime. It's very straightforward. And his playing, when as we evolved, recordings of his became part of our listening without any kind of unnecessary sentimentalities. And his music was based on the dances of the 1920s, ragtime of the, the teens, uh, and also ethnic styles. African-American style music, Jewish dances. So there was a mixture of, I mean, he went to Cuba, Cuban Overture, Charleston, Catfish Row, Porgy and Bess. He, he explored these areas hands-on to absorb the feeling of where he was and infuse that into his music. So the Rhapsody in Blue for me as a child was important. And I remember we had this simplified piano version of it, just the theme, bum, 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 of the theme. Uh -huh. I learned that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then as I got a little older, uh, we bought the piano solo version, and I learned that. Then I started to play it with orchestra. And I was still exploring. I remember 1991 is when I really started to see the piece separately from the classical mindset. Mm -hmm. And certainly not anywhere where lots of liberties and rhythmic, like it was not the swing area. It, it wasn't bam, 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 da, 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 da. No oh, dotted yeah. rhythms. That wasn't what he wrote. He went, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. very straightforward with him. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to realize this is not swing music. It's not drippy, overly romanticized music with, lots of liberties taken. This is pretty straightforward. And I played it uh, with the Savannah Symphony in Georgia for a festival they had. And Harold Schoenberg, who was the great New York Times music critic, he was the chief for many years, 
he actually was there at the rehearsal because he has a, he was doing a symposium or some lectures at the, as part of the festival. He came to the rehearsal and I saw him after. And he says, you know, it's very interesting what you do. It's like a combination of Chopin meets Tim Pan Alley. Mm-hmm. I thought, gee, I wish you'd write the review. <laughs> I said, you know, it's interesting you say that because I'm mm-hmm. starting to feel the piece more for what it really is instead of what I think it should be or influenced by anything that I've heard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you tried to do that with Beethoven, you'd be killed. But with Gershwin, people think, yeah, I could play it the way I want. I could add this. I could do that. I could do that. I could do this. And I thought, well, I'm going to make believe I never heard this piece before. And I'm going to play it in a way I think maybe Gershwin, I don't want to imitate him, Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to do it so far out of the way of what he did. Oh, yeah. It says music. And what is the style? What is the style? Mm. It's this hustle, bustle, driving energy and some beautiful melodies and songs. And I just thought, you know, don't make it more than it is. Don't make Mm. it less, but don't make it more. Because then it becomes more about you playing it instead of the music being played by you. Mm. And I I approach that with all the music. But Mm. this piece in particular, it's got its um, hot spots. And Mm. it's very easy to indulge. Mm. It is. But... I don't think that's what he wanted. Mm. He was not that kind of composer. Um, so bringing it even to now, memorizing the critical edition, and there's so many different versions. Oh, I don't play that. I play chords there. Oh, I don't play that at all. Oh, those notes are so different. That doesn't start on that note, it starts on that note. The chords are a little different. So I'm now at the point of playing it according to what the latest sources of the original scores are. Mm. And it's a challenge, but I just feel good doing it. I feel Mm. like it's the right thing to do. Um, Now that people might say, well, why did it take so long or why did it change? You know, keyboard music of J.S. Bach, there are different editions. Mm. there are different notes different scales different things and why uh j.s bach played the music and his students notated those editions are by his students most Mm. of them and they're different because he played them differently so Uh. the sources you have of gershwin playing the piece differently led into you know it's like the game of telephone you say something to this person, to that person, oh, to yeah. that person. Yeah. And by the time it gets here, it isn't what that person mm. said. So I wanted to go all the way back. What did you yeah. say? What did you say? Oh, first? yeah, yeah, yeah. But that I, I like because I think this is this is in very authentic what you're doing. It's trying to uh, do the authentic thing. Yeah. And to bring forth what the what the composer intended mm. now sometimes composers change things mm. because they think it's better another way or they'll cut things but in this case especially being a rhapsody mm. which means sections sewn together if you cut them out you're cutting out oh, yeah. fat fabric from mm. the garment musical mm. garment it's it changes it and you know there would be places where people would hear something played then a pause and then something new mm. and i think critics used to say there would be these abrupt changes and you know it's not well structured well that's because things were cut and oh, once you yeah. start cutting things you can't put them back you have to start over again so this is what they did they started over again and went back to the basics but do you think the the audiences are used to hearing it in a different way and that this original way will be then it's something it's really they new, you know, because it hasn't been yeah. heard before? Um, they love it. I mean, wherever I, I've played it, I mean, I've only played the smaller version in Colorado. Uh, orchestras, for the most part, are still playing the bigger Mm. score because they have that or that's what they know 
but even at the piano part, at least, I'm doing what's mm. from the original sources because you could do that and it doesn't affect the sound. Um, it's going to take time, mm. but they have at least the option to use the 1924 smaller group, which isn't so small, it sounds pretty big. Or then there's the 1927, which I've actually played before, which is very good too. Just adds a little bit more players. Or they used the bigger one in 1942. Mm. The, you know, the MGM musical was a big thing, big sound, big orchestra. And they did that. Mm. Um, personally, for me, the 1942 score, it's good. It's too much. It drowns out the piano. You have to tell everybody to play quieter. It's It's almost like, Mm. two stakes when you just need one uh, <laughs> it's okay. too much it's too much it's too much sound for the style yeah. he intended oh, okay. yeah. but it works mm. but the earlier versions are better because they're more in sync with what he how he wrote it yeah. and the kind of sound he wanted so now tell me who who are who, uh, who is all involved in this now how did you get together and and um everybody get so enthusiastic as you are <laughs> well it becomes then the business part of it you have to raise yeah. money and uh, we were very fortunate the orchestra adrian symphony uh, has a wonderful staff and they were able to get a grant mm -hmm. to cover the orchestra and i was able to secure funds the billy rose foundation helped tremendously because one of the guys who's there, uh, he's a, a, a trustee on the board, loves Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, okay. And That's it's such good. an interesting story. I've met him uh, when we were in person. They're going back to in person. I met uh, him at a uh, piano camp. It's a piano retreat. And it's the Sonata Piano Camp. They have it for adults in Vermont throughout the year. Faculty meet there. Students come from all over the country. And it's like a, a week long retreat where it's all piano, mm. all piano. It's fabulous, run by uh, Polly Vanderlinda. Her mom started it. It's over 50 years old. I met him there. And I played Rhapsody in Blue there, one of the faculty concerts, and we got to talking. And then online, of course, I was teaching him and seeing him. And we created a wonderful friendship based on Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, and I told him good. about the recording, and he says, let's figure out how we could be part of that. Mm. So, Thanks to him, it's helped tremendously to cover costs because in order to release the recording, you have to, you know, you can release digitally. And I made, you know, a small batch of CDs, which are available uh, through Amazon and everywhere. But digitally, it's available wherever people could find it. You could find the you know, type Rhapsody in Blue, Ryan Banyagali, B-A-N-A-G-A-L-E. Uh, and you find it, but you have to, I had to go through many hoops on this, mm. as I did with the other recording with Keith Emerson, you know, Naxo said, you must have written permissions mm. to release the recording by the publishers. Oh, they live in, you know, mm. Keith, mm. so from Keith Emerson, Neil Sadaka, uh, their publishers, uh, and G. Shermer for the Duke Ellington piece, mm -hmm. and uh, for Rhapsody in Blue, it had to be uh, Warner Chapel. So I had mm -hmm. to wait and do go through all the hoops to get the permissions from these companies uh, for the publishers to release that recording. Same thing for the Rhapsody in Blue. Not only through the Gershwin Initiative, I went to the family and the publisher. You have to secure the rights oh, okay. to get the license. Mm. And I was given license for this mm. to record it by the Gershwin estate, which you can't do it otherwise. Uh -huh. And if you do, it's a big mistake <laughs> you oh, have right. to do that. <laughs> well, it's just, and it's also respect, you know, yeah. to, to yeah, all course. parties. But the other part of it is the mechanical license. Now, some people would say, wait a minute, Map City Blues 1924. What do you need mechanical license? Well, what do you need permission? It's just public domain now. It took the time, but it's now public domain. Well, in Ryan's edition, although it's 1924, he put in there a few things that Gershwin did in his own performances mm -hmm. in the piano part that were a little after that. 
So it becomes oh, like an all-encompassing critical mm -hmm. edition based on that time. So if that's not in public domain, the recording of George Gershwin playing or whatever other sources he um, derived this edition from, then you need to have publisher permission license and then mechanical license, which means because it's on my label, it's called Naturally Sharp. Okay, uh, okay. so that's the yeah. name of the label. Mm -hmm. But in order for a private label or independent mm -hmm. label to release digital recording, you have to upfront pay for mechanical license. Oh, really? Per download, per oh. CD. Mm -hmm. So I, I, through raising the grants, for the recording, I have it through a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And the nonprofit has been the American Composers Forum, which was the American Music Center fused into the Composers Forum for over 20 years. So I've done all the commissioning projects with composers uh, with their help. So as a nonprofit, they're able to open accounts for each project. And uh, as a result, we have the account for this recording. From that, I have to pay the mechanical licenses for this recording, which means oh, I, see. I believe I did. I'm doing it slowly. Mm. 1,000 digital downloads worth. So you have to pay according to the amount of time on the recording, and it's all mm. it's all uh, calculated based mm. on the amount of minutes as a single track. So they do the calculation, and if you want a thousand digital downloads, mechanical licenses, here's how much it's going to cost and you have to pay it. Mm. So that has to be paid from through the uh, support. Mm. So that's how that works. For, for CDs, I only made a small batch of 200. So oh, that's see. also okay. mechanical license. Now yeah. this beautiful cover. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, you cool? did the I'll artwork, you. yeah. And the it's back, beautiful. which has yeah. writing, of course, you have to you know look at it carefully. Yeah. But the keyboard, and then we have a, a separate image for the CD. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's a little different yeah. from this yeah. to that. It's a little cleaner for the CD. Yeah. And that's, this was done by Larry Williams, mm -hmm. husband of Bruce Kiesling, the conductor. Larry's a fan. Mm -hmm. He works with major orchestras and he's really quite terrific. So he created a beautiful cover for this. And what's interesting is I always loved record albums when I was a kid, those you know, big yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. a little record album. Yeah. You just here's the record. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like a little record album. You know. So that's yeah. kind of different. Yeah. I liked that. I didn't need a whole big thing with opening and pages and Clean. Yeah. Less yeah. is more. Yeah. So Beautiful. that's for release. Yeah. Oh, I think that is so wonderful. And I think I love that it's the original version, basically what you're doing. And uh, uh, I think it's it's great um, that it's out there and that it can be heard in that way that it was intended. It it's a wonderful yeah. uh, sound. The yeah. sound is quite remarkable. I know what Ryan says. Uh, so on this recording, he talks about uh, how it all came to be. Mm. And uh, I will say, let me, I should just say that the recording uh, is supported in part by a grant from the Arts mm. Research Institute at the University of California, oh, Santa uh, Cruz, Santa Cruz, mm. and then the Billy Rose Foundation and the Weekend Family Foundation. Mm. And the edition was prepared as part of the Gershwin Initiative of at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Um, Wonderful. So the Weekend Family Foundation also, I, I've known the family for mm. over 30 years. They, I mm. met them through the Chopin Foundation in the United States oh, okay. when mm. I performed there. And we've stayed friends for years. Mm. So, you know, it's just all a, it's a labor of love. Mm. I love to do these projects and fundraise for them. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't get a fundraiser fee. I just, oh. <laughs> I mean, but but JP, would, you, I mean, you can, are... but I wouldn't. I, I just do it because I love to do it. Yeah, and that's important, and it's, it's just think, kind of part yeah. of history. 
I think and it's it's your enthusiasm as well and you know why you do these things and it's very uh, it's uh, I can you can sense that it's that you enjoy it so much and that it's so important as well to you. It is. I enjoy it because I could play it. Yeah. And another part of it is just this silent um dedication to the future you just mm. want to do things that are going to be used and important later on and maybe more so than now most of the time new music is composed and they either they don't get performed much again or later mm. on they become like the most performed pieces. Look at music mm. of the last several years, composers that are now starting to get mm. performed more just because of sociological evolvement. I don't mm. say changes. I don't think anything changes. I think things mm. evolve. That's just the way I am. My teacher once said, you know, people don't change. They just reveal themselves more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly, it's, yeah. And I think music evolves too. Yeah. Do you know, so we'll um, yeah, uh, there is a, um, a conductor in Berlin, um, Gareth, Gareth Kiest. Yes. Do you know Gareth? I've known him in the past and we stay in touch just very... Yeah, because he's doing this, he has this orchestra, um, the Berlin Academy of American Music. Oh, really? Yeah, and he, he plays music of, of American uh, composers. And this is so, yeah, this is uh, also interesting. interesting. I had an interview with him and and I didn't even, re you know, you, you don't think of it that way. But but of course, in, in America, they are very uh, important. It is also a very important um, uh, part of the music evolving mm -hmm. and, and yes. uh, the, uh, the, the, the composers. Uh, that came, I think it's, it's this thing because I will ask him also from, he was talking about composers from Europe that went over to America um, and then did, you know, their work, composing work there. And I was thinking also of how that must have uh, changed or did it change the sound or is there a specific sound that you can say, this is American composer, so we can, we can definitely see that in um, history that there, there's that different sound you know if you listen to music by copeland mm. bernstein i mean you hear a lot of copeland-esque things in bernstein's music uh romantic sound they were inspired mm. by european composers whether they were it's still in europe or if they came to the united states mm. uh, the american school of composing i mean i did a few um episodes for sirius xm uh for living american series and last year it's about the piano concerto mm. and it was all about american composers it started all the way back to like the amy beach piano concerto which was a very european sounding piece mcdowell also and as time went forward uh the American school of composers were perhaps inspired and influenced by their European counterparts, mm -hmm. but it, it took on a sound of its own. Copeland music is based on American folk music also. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't, it would be based on Cuban rhythms. Gershwin did that. Uh, Bernstein did that. It was always whatever was closer to home, you know, the Latin American yeah. sound. So that was infused in their music. Howard Hansen, too. Howard Hansen Piano Concerto, 1948 or so. Very jazzy. But then there was this American sound of using the intervals of fourths or triads and ninths, like chords built on ninths, but also based on uh, American folk music. Oh. and American hymns. You know, I recently composed, uh, a, well, last year, last October, I composed a piece uh, in honor of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. But that piece is more impressionistic, neo-impressionist in a way, meaning 
more contemporary melodic song-like melodies in an impressionistic texture, ah, okay. meaning atmospheric based on whole tone scales, mm. pentatonic scales. And I wrote that and then I was asked by Dallas Symphony if I could play that in October this year uh, after Ellen Tapes Willicks remembering Ruth Bader Ginsburg for uh, mezzo-soprano Denise Graves, myself and the orchestra. I said, I'd love to, let me get it orchestrated. And one of my students, who was a young 25 year old American pianist, arranger, composer. He was doing a lot of interesting things. And I asked him, Harrison Sheckler, would you orchestrate around what I did? You wanna be my Ferdy Grofe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll give you some ideas what to do, but I want you to do the rest. And he came up with a beautiful orchestration and it's getting, it's hearing for the first time with Dallas Symphony. Amazing. Oh, that's but awesome. that sound, what is American? Mm. American is influenced, inspired by everyone who came here from somewhere else. Mm. That's American. And then they built on that through the century. Then we went into minimalist music, 12 tone music. Uh, John Cage, Philip Glass, Jennifer Higdon, Ellen Tapes Willett. I mean, the list goes on and on to the school where of American composers that I created commissioning projects for. So you'd have uh, Ellen Tapes Willick, who was, when she started out, it was a much more uh, atonal, thorny sound, and it relaxed over time. It's much jazzier now. It's oh, interesting over yeah. the years. Mm -hmm. And then Lowell Lieberman, schooled at Juilliard, fabulous composer, very uh, American in a way, but seeped into Schumann and Brahms, but with his own language. Richard Danielpour, William Bolcom, Jake Runestad, uh, Lucas Richman, who was a student of uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein. I always tell Lucas, you wrote the piano concerto that Bernstein didn't write, but it's um, yours and it's gorgeous. It's called In Truth. And we recorded that with Pittsburgh Symphony a few years ago, Kenneth Fuchs. Juilliard trained dear friend, beautiful atmospheric piano concerto spiritualist based on paintings. So the American sound, Christopher Theophanidis, even Peter Shickley, I mean, uh, so many different composers, Daniel Pertu, I'm doing his piece coming up soon, Jim Stevenson, uh, it's Peter Boyer, his new Rhapsody mm -hmm. in Red and Blue will be in two years. The American sound is different for each composer mm -hmm. because they come from different training. Oh, yeah. So even this year, I wrote two new pieces. After the Ginsburg piece, I wrote, um, that's free, a reflection of justice. This, then I wrote in July two pieces, reflection of equality for Martin Luther King and reflection of freedom for John F. Kennedy. And I created a piano concerto of those, an American piano concerto based on three historic figures, JFK, RBG, MLK. And for different Amazing. reasons, freedom, mm -hmm. justice, equality, and they're being orchestrated by Harrison Sheckler. So mm -hmm. I want to bring this into 2022, perhaps to perform yeah. and more well, and more. But it's a different sound, different sound, mm -hmm. different. My, my sense of American, it's piano. But what I did with those is I created themes based on their names. Oh, yeah. I made a musical alphabet, created that's another, we could do that mm -hmm. one day, talk yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would yeah. love to talk to that, about that. Um, but Jeffrey, now, uh, you're also a Steinway artist. Yes. And, um, uh, and, and you have your Steinway piano. What does it entail for you to be the Steinway artist? I think you have to own one, and then you yeah. have to perform. And then when you perform... You were endor endorsing the um, manufacturer, Steinway yeah. and Sons. Mm. And you will play the Steinway in piano in concerts, recordings. And uh, basically, I think what it means is that if you play somewhere, you know, if you're not a Steinway artist and the, they, they want a Steinway, or they have to pay rental and cartage. Um, but I believe for Steinway artists, they don't have to pay the rental, just the cartage. Oh, I because see. then it's listed in programs, Steinway and Sons, mm -hmm. our artists. There's over a thousand Steinway artists. It's just, okay. it's just part of the family. You know, Steinway's oh, okay. a, yeah. I love the pianos. Um, 
And then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it was 2010 mm. when um, I was called by a representative of the company and they said, we're going to start a record label. We want you to be the first artist. Mm. And I, and I, this, is, this is a joke. I mean, me, mm. there's other people you should be asking, but they wanted to do that because they wanted a Christmas album. Oh, okay. Because um, I, I had done a holiday album uh, called Classical Carols mm -hmm. a few years before that, which are beautiful fusion pieces of classical car of ca Christmas carols fused with classical music that fit them harmonically, beautifully created by mm -hmm. Caroline Taylor. And you can buy the sheet music to those two. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that recording. They said, would you do a Christmas album for us? I said, I don't think that's a good idea. I felt really, oh. you know... Yeah. Kind of humble, but I felt like I had to like kind of say, I don't know if I want to do that first. Mm. I think maybe the first album should be something more traditional, mm. but not Beethoven, not Chopin, not Brahms, nobody that wrote for the piano. How about Bach, who didn't write for the piano? How mm. can the modern piano sound playing Bach's music? And we did Bach on a Steinway. That was the first recording really? on the label. Then the Christmas album came a year later. Oh, okay. And then another a tribute album to the style mm. of Joseph Levine came, Grand Romance. So were, later. You but then that's the, yeah. artist. were you then the first Steinway artist? Uh, for this record label, yes. Oh, Certainly the not the label. first Steinway oh, artist. Okay. Okay. To, you know, way back to the 18, late 1800s. Oh, really? You know, all, Is it so long that... The Oh, yes. But they had this time oh. artists. And they had tours from Europe. Oh. They would have a, a, a tour. They would tour a Steinway artist through the United States. Really? Recitals everywhere. It was, it was a flourishing time yeah. around amidst all the political and sociological um, strife. Oh, music okay. was a big deal. You know, oh, big I, didn't, deal. I didn't know that that. that has gone so far back, you know, that they had the, the yeah. Steinway artists, yeah. I think well, people I'm go a, to Steinway, I'm a, yeah. Mm, I'm not you go to Steinway.com, you could probably see the whole history. Really? Yeah, yeah well, I yeah. saw the documentary of the of pianos being made, and it's very interesting. But then yes. I'm not clued up, and, and I'm learning as I go along. <laughs> that's what we're here about, for. From we're everybody. All, we're all learning, yeah. The, that's this. what... That's why I ask all these questions that I, great. I really didn't know. <laughs> no, it's, 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 that's, that makes sense. Uh, Steinway has is, is a great history, and it's worth mm. just going and, and typing into a search. Mm. Steinway, history of Steinway, and you'll, oh, so much. Well, so, uh, you so know, the, yeah, Tina, who, who is um, working at, at Steinway, Steinway and Sons of Tampa Bay. Do you know Tina? Yes. Oh yeah. gosh, she's my one of. She should be the president. Of, I don't have a fan club. That's like ridiculous. I'm going to really? be the president. She's terrific. She posts. She's amazing. Yeah. She posts some of my, and the only way I get to see what I did for Spirio, the playback system, the player yeah. piano system, is when Tina posts them. Tina Georgia, really? when yeah. she posts the um, Spirio recordings. I'm like, wow, I don't get to hear. I mean, I went years ago and was part of the experimental process yeah. for Spirio. That's S-P-I-R-I-O. Uh -uh. That's yeah. their player piano technology. Yeah. And it does play back the way we played. It's really? so interesting. But I never yeah. heard them because we, we I'd record everything and then they'd have everything edited. So mm. I've never really, I don't think I've been in a showroom where I, be able to see and hear my recordings. I think I'd probably be spooked out, really? but it's kind of cool. <laughs> well, she gave me a tour of the whole um of their their gallery. Yeah. And it's amazing. Wow. Yeah. I it's on Zoom. You can you can check it out on Zoom. I've got it. Yeah, it's one of the interviews oh. I did. She did a she did a a, a, a whole tour and showed everything and showed the Spirio and yeah, it's oh amazing. My. She's a oh, I'll have to look incredible that. woman now doing a, a lot. She's, I think, um, yeah, it, it does a lot for, for the company. She does because mm. she's passionate about it. Like Very I said, much, there's a yeah. driving force inside and Definitely. she has that. Yeah. You don't get that all the time and no, from her. No. 
Yeah. You feel it. She really yeah. loves yeah. it. She loves mm -hmm. it. It's yeah. great. But Jeffrey, this was so lovely to talk to you again. And, it's a pleasure. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and you have to let me know um, uh, about this other um, recording. Are you going to record your work, your, your composition? I don't know if that's even in the cards yet. You know, it's oh, like okay. the yellow brick road. It's somewhere around the tree, about 300 oh, okay. feet to the right <laughs> that I don't even see. Well, the first thing, first thing is to get to get it performed as a performed. trio yeah. of pieces of three okay. reflections they're called so once i have that and i know when it is we mm. could we you let me know yeah, yes, yeah definitely yes. definitely we'll well you do so many interesting things i'll uh i'll stalk you on facebook <laughs> <laughs> that's fine well the first thing is harrison needs to orchestrate it and get it into a score and then okay. i have a wonderful student at brooklyn college who is a he's a, a technical whiz as yeah. an engineer with this. He, he creates the audio demo oh, okay. and he makes it sound like a real orchestra. He's got such a good program and yeah. good ears. Mm. His name is Ji Chen, good pianist, mm. but mm. this is really, he does gaming music. He composes music. He improvises. Really? He's nine, mm -hmm. 20 years old. He's so talented. Mm. And he's created the demo for the, uh, Justice Ginsburg's piece that's getting played in Dallas, but he's going to create it from the scores once Harrison is finished. It's just, I'm very grateful to them and um, happy to be able to include their names everywhere I can because yeah. it's good for them to get known because of what mm. they do. I mean, I, I think people looking for demos of scores by mm. composers to Chi Chang, he's fabulous. It's gorgeous oh, right. demos he makes. And yes. Harrison is a wonderful orchestrator and arranger. The young kids, the new generation. So I will let you yeah. know. I'll keep you posted. Yes, yes. please, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Jeffrey, have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. You too. In, in New York or yes. in Long Island? You're in Long Island. Long Island, yes. Yeah. Okay. And we'll speak soon. I look forward. Thank you so okay. much for your time and for this. Thank no, you. No, it's so interesting and always lovely to talk to you. Same here. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.